Hey, hi everybody. It's me, Chris, in beautiful Cambodia. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, what's funny is my power just went off for an hour. And uh, so I was without power, which means there's no air conditioner. And uh, the good thing is it was kind of breezy outside. And uh, so it happened last night uh, as well that um, my power went off for an hour last night as well. And so maybe they're just doing some work on the lines or something, but uh, it's a lot better than when I went to India when they turned off the power like every night for hours. <laughs> and we had to have backup generators um, at the uh, apartment I rented over there uh, just to, to keep us with power and air conditioning. So, um, yeah, so this is my second day without power. I was going to do a live stream today, but for the life of me, uh, I need to educate myself more on it. I, I have no clue on, on uh, why it's not working, but it's not. See, look, I'll point it out. There, I think you can see it. Let's go live. Just been spinning, doing nothing. So anyway, maybe I'll ask one of my friends uh, how to do it. And he's pretty knowledgeable, so he'll uh, he'll uh, educate me, I'm sure. Uh, today, I was going to talk to everybody about um, how you can use difficulties in your life. I see life is an education. It's a, it's a classroom. Everything that you go through in life and uh, that you experience in the material realm, everything is meant to uh, teach you something. Yeah, life's not just a, like a random series of events. I mean, certainly if you take enough drugs and you drink enough alcohol or uh, you just let your mind go everywhere and without a, living your life with any kind of purpose uh, just on the day-to-day day -day moment, which uh, can be fun, I'm sure. I've done that before in my younger days. Um, but um, a goal for your life uh, to become more spiritually introspective and to, uh, to learn how to love yourself and love others and um, to reconnect yourself to God, who is pure love. And so, um, you know, yesterday I was thinking, I was meditating yesterday, and I was thinking uh, that, and it's the truth too, that the soul actually never leaves God. It's impossible. You cannot leave God. Now, because uh, the soul wants to experience what it's like to be God or uh, wants to experience matter in order to uh, become more advanced spiritually, um, it's like a play. Life is like a play. And you you never leave God. You're completely connected to God. You cannot get away from that fact. You're connected to every single other living entity in the world as well. You cannot get away from that either because that's the reality of your spiritual existence as you're completely connected with God 24 hours a day. Now, if you set up a barricade, if your ego wants to experience something separate from God, which is impossible, by the way, um, then uh, because you want to experience uh, separate and, and be disconnected from God, which is stupid and an impossibility, then your ego comes into play and covers your soul with 
a material form. Um, truth be told, nothing can exist without God's presence and God's uh, spiritual light you know, shining through it. Nothing can exist. Matter cannot exist. The planets cannot exist. Everything is connected with God and is in God completely. But when you want to uh, experience something separate or you want to become God, at that point, then God lets you uh, pretend that you're different things in order to, uh, I mean, because it's impossible. It's impossible to be God. But uh, when you when you want to be separate from God or you, ha you want to learn something in the world or anything like that, God has to create this illusion, this material illusion, uh, in order to uh, make you feel like you're independent and separate from Him, which you never are. You never leave, <laughs> you actually never leave God's kingdom. It's an impossibility. But because you're grabbing onto the material existence and holding on tightly, it's like a tree. It's like a tree, okay? <laughs> Look at it this way. It's like a tree. If you go up to a tree, and you can try this if you want. <laughs> if you go up to a tree and you grab the tree and you hold on to that tree, and then you yell out, let me go, let me go, let me go. <laughs> See, that's our situation in the world, is we're holding on to this illusion really tightly. We're, you know, this is, we want to hold on to it and see this as a reality, which it is not. But when we're holding on to this reality, and yet we are screaming inside, looking for happiness, looking for satisfaction, looking for love, looking to reconnect with God, which when you do that is billions of times better than this material existence. But, uh, but then you're holding on to this material illusion, yelling, let me go, let me go. All you have to do is let go. <laughs> All you have to do is let go. There is no such thing as, uh, okay, the body, this machine you call the body, that you move is not who you are. You're the soul that controls the body and that lives inside this um, shell that's covering you. And you can see for a fact that you are not this body. It is not possible. I mean, if you get in your car, if you get in your car, these are just some examples. If you get in your car, and then, and some people do this too, like this, so you get into a Ferrari, for, for instance, and uh, you say, uh, you get in, you shut the door, and then you drive like a, like a rebel. Say you drive like a rebel, really aggressive, fast, and then you associate with that car saying, this is me, this is who I am. You know, this car's fast, I'm fast. You know, I mean, it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. It's like uh, we're, we're inside a, a machine and we're moving it around, you know. When the, when the body is, no longer functions, you get a, you get a different uh, body. It could be spiritual. It could be another material body based on your desires and your karma and what you've set yourself up for in this life. What have, you, what have we done with ourselves in this world? Uh, what have we done with our life? Uh, how, how hard have we tried and made an effort to become happy eternally? Eternally. When we connect to God, the pleasure from reconnecting with, with God is, is unimaginable. And um, when you see that pleasure, when you reconnect, you don't want anything else. You wonder how these uh, 
these monks and yogis and spiritual people, they can give up the world. They don't give it up uh, for, you know, some shallow pleasure. They give up the world because they become fully addicted to the real pleasure, which is connecting with God. And that's why they give up the world, because they want eternal pleasure, they want to be happy forever, and they know that that's where uh, the only place we can uh, be spiritually connected with God and we'll be happy forever. We'll be high forever, and stay high forever too. And you know, there's some artificial means. Artificial, now let's look at drugs for example. And um, hopefully I won't go off the, the topic here, but um, let's look at drugs. Uh, these are artificial means to uh, experience an altered reality and to experience um, the, um, what the possibilities are of not being encased in a body and having uh, altered consciousness. I mean, because if you're connected with this body and you think you're this machine and you think that you're this body, your consciousness is, it's dull. It's very dull. And uh, you can't experience this higher consciousness, this altered consciousness, this freedom that you get from reconnecting with God. And he wants to reconnect with us as well. So the more we run towards God, the more we reconnect towards God, the happier we become, the more addicted we become, and then, um, then we can become eternally happy. And I know, you know, I've lost many people in my lifetime. Many people, many people. And, you know, you miss them, of course. I miss, I miss the people that I've lost. I'm not going to go into details about it, but, um, you know, the material world, it means loss. It means loss. Lord Buddha, as a matter of fact, uh, he had a lady uh, come up to him whose son had just passed away. And she said to Lord Buddha, she said, um, Lord Buddha, please bring my son back to life. They also did that with Lord Jesus. They came up to Lord Jesus and uh, did a story of Lazarus as, well, Lazarus as well. And a lot of people would bring uh, people, uh, the corpses, to Lord Jesus and say, please, please, you know, uh, make their body alive again, their body. You know, your soul, your soul never dies. It's, it's, it's always complete. Nothing can harm it. But they wanted the body to be alive again so it can move around in a body on the material, you know, plane. And Lord Buddha, he said, he said, um, okay, he said, uh, go to um, every house in this uh, village here. And there were several hundred people in the village. He said, go to every house, knock on the door. And um, if you can find one house, where no one has died, I want you to collect some uh, some uh, food from the house and bring it here, and I'll, I will bring your son back to life. And so, uh, anyway, uh, so she went around the, like the two, three hundred houses in the in the village, and she uh, asked everybody, "Is there, has anyone died in the in the house?" And uh, everyone told her, you know, no. Uh, there's someone has died here, but his house were very old. So um, she came back to Lord Buddha. She said, uh, I cannot find any house where someone has not died. Every single house in this village, someone has died in it. And he says, yes, that's, a, that's, a, that's the point. It's like, and then she realized, she realized that everybody passes away. Everybody dies. Everybody dies. Your body dies. Your soul never dies. So then she became his student. She became his student, or Buddhist student. She says, now I understand now. I understand uh, what you're telling me. 
you know, that, that it's, it's uh, you know, this world is temporary. Everybody leaves it. Everybody leaves it. You cannot stay here. That's a fact. You cannot stay in the world. It is a fact. If you make this world as your reality, at the time that you have to leave this world and go to uh, a better place, which you have never left, <laughs> but when you finally you're awakened to the fact that you're in the spiritual world with God, then you don't you don't ever you know all these people that have had near death experiences and everything they don't ever want to come back never never want to come back none of them there is not one person that has had a near death experience that wants to come back to this world. Why would they? They have everything. They have love. All your friends are up there. They're happy 24 hours a day. And although we may miss them, and I, I miss uh, a lot of people that, that were, uh, I've had relationships with and things that, that have uh, passed away or left the world. Um, yes. We do miss them, of course, you know, uh, because everybody's beautiful. Everybody's soul is beautiful. And we do miss having them around in the material world. But on, this, on the same token, I'm very happy for them that, that they're uh, experiencing happiness 24 hours a day serving God. So, so that's... Uh, that's uh, what, what I was kind of thinking about today. And uh, also, it, it's about suffering in the world. You know, certainly losses uh, come, up, come our way so many times in this world. And we're, we're made to, to contemplate them and uh, use them to surrender to God. As far as drugs go, there's this drug... Um, and I saw it on YouTube, and I've known about it, and it's in Peru, and it's called DMT. And DMT is something that occurs in your body naturally, in your brain. Now, what this drug does, and then they use a combination of, um, I think they have some poisonous frog venom, poisonous frog venom that they administer to you, and they also take these two two uh, plants. One I think is called the death vine. I don't know the, the the name of it. I could look it up and find out. But anyway, um, well, if you're interested, you can look it up online. But it's called ayahuasca. And what that does is called the death vine. They mix two two vines together. It's quite poisonous. Uh, and they, a lot of times they put uh, the poisonous uh, frog venom with it as well. And you know, they, they give you a drink of that stuff. And the first thing you do is you vomit everything out of your guts. It's a, it's a cleansing ritual. And they have it like a ritual. And you vomit everything out of your guts into a big bucket they put in front of you. And a lot of people uh, soil themselves as well. Because it's like a laxative and a purgative. So the ayahuasca, it brings you to the point of near death. That's why they're experiencing all of this out-of-body experiences and stuff. It's a poison. Um, and some people do die from drinking it as well. They don't come back. They don't come back. But I think it's their personal choice. They don't want to come back after what they see. But it brings you to that point of almost dying. And at that point, they see, it releases all that DMT from your, from your brain. At that point, they see unlimited possibilities and freedom from the burden of walking around in a machine uh, pretending that you're one way or another, or this or that, or whatever, your belief systems, your put in place everything that you, you know throughout your whole life then you you, uh, you take with you um, 
as a burden. It's a burden. Okay. So, a lot of people are doing this ayahuasca. When they come back from these ayahuasca ceremonies, they're completely changed. And they say that this drug, because it shows people the reality of death and uh, the freedom of uh, the encasement of the body, that when these people wake up off of their ayahuasca trip, if they wake up, if they don't die, then um, they say that these people have a really different view of life. It's a different view of life. Now, meditation can awaken this DMT naturally, and because uh, it's in, it's in, it's produced in our body, in the brain, and so meditation can release all of these. Uh, we have many, many types of um, things that can be released from your brain to, to, to give you unlimited different experiences through your different chakras. And, uh, but they're doing it in an artificial way. And they say that um, when they come back from these near-death experiences, they're changed person. It said that a lot of people, it cures their um, schizophrenia. It says a lot of people, it, it cures their um, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. Uh, it says that uh, it cures a lot of things. It actually puts so much poison in your body, that frog venom and the, the, uh, the death vines, puts so much poison in your body it probably kills all the parasites in your body, too. It probably kills all, all the parasites in your physical body because of all the poison that you're putting in your system. And like I say, it's a pur purgative and it's a laxative. So it's purging all bad elements out of your body. So in that sense, it's a good thing. Um, but a lot of people get, they get addicted to that experience of doing that. And um, you can do it naturally through meditation and prayer and through opening your, all your chakras, especially your third eye chakra and your forehead area. Uh, you can experience all of that naturally. And you can stay high forever. Now, this is the trip to the ayahuasca, ayahuasca <laughs> which I can't even say. <laughs> but... The, the trip that it, that takes you on lasts for four hours. That's a four-hour hallucinogenic trip. And uh, but if you, you can stay high forever, just by meditation and prayer, and you can by reconnection with God, you can experience love and happiness forever. And that's really a, what our goal in life should be. Um, but. Suffering is part of life. You can't get away from it. Life comes at you in waves. First there's happiness, then there's distress. Then there's happiness, then there's distress. Then there's happiness, and then there's distress. And without distress, you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, feel any happiness. You wouldn't know, you know what it was. So there's happiness, distress, sadness. Uh, these things, is, this is uh, the material situation. You also have uh, miseries caused by other living entities, by insects. Miseries caused by insects. You have miseries caused by other people. Other people can cause you miseries. Um, you have a lot of toxic people. Just think about it. If someone is completely convinced that they're their body and that the goal of their life is to serve their senses and to experience everything for themselves. That everyone, everything and everyone is meant to be pleasing for that particular soul. Um, that would be a narcissist. And those people give people unlimited pain because they go around and they try and suck everybody into their negative world and trying to um, force everybody down onto their level of consciousness, which is very low and very uh, subhuman. 
but at any rate, so we have we have miseries by insects, we have miseries by people that bring us miseries. We have miseries by the weather, too hot, too cold. We have miseries by artificial situations, mm, so many different kinds. Miseries of the body, you might have cancer, you might have uh, parasites, you might have something, you might have, you know, you know, uh, you might get sick. So there's so many different miseries that you can experience in this world, but miseries can be used to pro propel you to the greatest, greatest destination. There was a queen in India by the name of Queen Kunti, and uh, she was in India 5,000 years ago. Queen Kunti had uh, just a life of hardship. And if you want to read about Queen Kunti, you can read the Mahabharata of India. And uh, it tells about Queen Kunti. And she was always praying. Her life was just tragic and terrible. I mean, she one day she went to, into the court of another king and they ripped all of her clothes off. And, and she was a queen. They ripped all of her clothes off and made her stand there naked to embarrass her. You know, that's another thing a narcissist does. They try and embarrass you and make, and make you belittle you so that they feel like they're superior to you, which they're not, they're inferior. However, uh, Queen Kunti, that was one of the things that happened to her in public. She was disrobed and made fun of in a public assembly. You can imagine how, uh, how that would feel, not very good. And then uh, she went and, and left the kingdom and she went to her, of course she was a queen, so she had a nice, um, no, there's a mosquito, I hate those things. So, um, so she went to uh, her, um, like her cabin out in the woods and that king stalked her, gang stalked her. Now we would call that gang stalking. But that king gang stalked her. And when her and her, and her five children were in that cabin, it was like a, like a remote palace, you know, like a summer palace or something. And um, they went and poured varnish all over the outside of it and lit it on fire. Yeah, so, uh, and then they drove her into the forest and she was a queen. She had everything. She had riches. She had power. And then, so they tried to murder her by burning her house down. They disrobed her in public. They chased her all over, gang stalked her. And then they made her live in the woods for like, uh, gosh, I think like 10 years, something like that, as far as I remember. But uh, then they made her live in the woods and, uh, you know, with bare necessities of life, you know, right out in the open in the woods. And if you ever lived in the woods, you know how hard that is. But Queen Kunti didn't see all of these difficulties in her life as an impediment. She would just pray, she would pray more and more. The more harder her life was, she would pray more and more, Dear Lord, thank you for all these sufferings that you're sending me. Please, please send me more. Because if you don't send me, if you don't make me suffer in life, then I won't want to pray or meditate and remember you. So that was her love for God. And uh, and there's another lady, a saint in India named Mirabai. And she's one of my favorite saints because she married a man that um, was just a total tyrant to her tried to force her into, uh, you know, becoming unchaste and living a horrible, you know, materialistic life. And of course, they had money, but she didn't want to do that. She wanted to just pray and meditate on God. So she would, she would go to the temple every day, and she'd just pray all day, and she'd stay there all day. And when she had to go home, which she never wanted to do, but when she had to go home, she went home, and she would fight with her husband and try and, you know, ask him to, you know, change his ways and, and to, you know, 
become more godlike and loving God instead of living the way he was as a tyrant and a bully. But he wouldn't listen. So one day, after she became so pure and powerful, she walked over to the temple and she walked into the deities. In India, they have deities or forms of God that they worship. And uh, she walked right into the temple and she was had developed so many yogic powers, she walked right into the form of God and disappeared forever. So uh, I've been to that temple in India because she was one of my favorite saints. And... Um, and I've seen the temple where she used to pray every day. She'd pray for hours, for eight, ten hours a day. So she used that suffering. See, that's how you can use suffering to become self-realized and become happy. And um, and so that was kind of the message today. But uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll do some more topics in the next couple of days. Have a blessed day. Always. Feel free to like and subscribe so we can get the message onto the algorithms, to the YouTube algorithms. And then you'll also be notified anytime a video comes out. Stay safe and happy. And God bless.